Uh, hi everyone, um, welcome back. So I hope you all enjoyed yesterday. Um, today we're uh, continuing. So, <laughs> uh, so this uh, today's talks are maybe a little bit um, different. So yesterday we heard a lot from startups and industry. Um, today we're going to be hearing, at least in the first session, more from uh, academics or at least people who are in academia at the moment. But um, I think quite a lot of people. Uh, in academia, haven't quite fully resisted the call of industry. Um, so first up, we've got uh, Josh Nunn from the University of Bath. Um, uh, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks, Ben, and thanks very much um, uh, for the invitation to, to come and speak. Um, and also, uh, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, apologies if some of you guys have seen uh, seen basically the same <laughs> talk before, um, but it's so so it's uh, yeah so so. Um, I'll, I'll talk about, um, talk. I think I just waited so long it died, um, and there you go. So I'll, I'll, okay, I'll just basically talk about the motivation for um, uh, the quantum memories that we've been working on, um, and, uh, and yes, I will basically use this slot to, uh, to plug uh, the, the spin-out company that's um, trying to commercialise this technology, so, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a, um, a grabbing opportunity. Um, so, uh, right. So, so, so the, so the, spiel, the spiel is is that um, we'd like to uh, build quantum photonic processes, um, and there are several routes to try to making that as, uh, try to make that to a scalable proposition, and one of them is uh, quantum memories, which I'll talk to you about. So, um, uh, I just took the train over from Bath, which is uh, something like ten minutes on the train, um, and we have this centre for photonics and photonic materials where we're able to make. Um, Bespoke optical fibers. So this is a, this is a neat picture, but it's actually a this is a, um, a fiber uh, cane which was cracked, and the cracks that have formed in like a spiral pattern. Um, so that's there isn't actually a, a useful fiber that looks like that. But um, but we can make hollow fibers. We can make photonic crystal fibers and other types of bespoke uh, structure if that's of interest to anyone. Um, so this is my uh, group over in Bath. Um, and uh, so, so uh, on, it, it's, it's, it's pretty small actually, and we're, we're working on light scattering in vapour, which is the stuff I'll, I'll talk about. And we also have um, a project on uh, uh, diamond optomechanics, and in particular, um, brilliant scattering, and there's a collaboration with uh, uh, Oxford Physics and, and actually Imperial Physics now, things are moving around um, on brilliant scattering in silica as well. Um, so, um, Right, so, so, so I guess just to sort of repeat this uh, motivation, um, actually all uh, platforms for um, quantum computing uh, require um, large-scale entangled states as a, as a resource, at least. I mean, so there's the, sort of the, the, the first uh, schemes for quantum computing were based on this sort of uh, sequential gate model, but the most modern schemes are based on uh, measurement-based quantum computing, where you prepare an entangled resource state, cluster state, um, and then you, um, uh, you, you implement your gates by making measurements on that state um, and you can also implement um, error correction by making uh, parity measurements on that state. So um, uh, th this is a little bit of a cheeky uh, uh, figure here, but um, uh, a, a key difference between photonic systems and, and other platforms for quantum computing such as uh, diamond colour centres, or superconducting qubits, or trapped ions, or spins in silicon, or quantum dots, is that um, they all have carrier frequencies for the, 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 sort of, uh, the qubit transition, which, are, which are, are, are very low in the microwave range, um, uh, and that means that to isolate them from uh, thermal noise, you need to either cool them down um, in a cryostat, or you need to uh, uh, trap them in a vacuum system and cool them down optically. Um, whereas uh, actual uh, photonic qubits have very high effective temperature because the carrier frequency of optical fields is like a, about 100 terahertz. And so it's really the only system that doesn't have, um, it doesn't suffer from any thermal noise at room temperature. So, so, so the potential is you can, you could really build a quantum computer that will just run in ambient conditions. It won't need cryogenics or vacuum systems or um, uh, shielding. Um, okay, but so this is the elephant in the room then. It would uh, be great if uh, photons would bounce off each other, uh, like they do in Star Wars, but of course they, they, they don't actually interact. So it's a problem for 
making a, a logical processor if it's impossible to get any kind of conditional evolution between uh, optical fields. Um, so you can actually do logic, um, and this is the this is the trick of uh, linear optical quantum computing, which was uh, uh, very much uh, pushed forward actually at, here at the University of Bristol. Um, and the idea is to you can implement logic operations by uh, interference and then followed by a measurement. And what the measurement does is it it collapses the wave function, and that's a nonlinear operation. And so you get an effective nonlinearity based on the detection of it. Um, but unfortunately, it's it's uh, probabilistic because measurements in quantum mechanics are probabilistic. Um, so uh, here is a scheme to build uh, entangled states. Um, this is the GHZ state. Is uh, so that yes, doesn't mean gigahertz. So the the, the Greenberger Horn Zeilinger state um, is a, a sort of a key building block that you would use to build up a much larger entangled resource state. Um, and and this is a well known scheme for how to. Uh, uh, build one of these states using linear optics. So you uh, you need some photon sources, photon factories, whatever you want to call them, uh, which are, you'll know a lot of a lot of teams, also commercial teams, are working on. Um, you need to interfere them, and you need to make some detections. There are six detectors here. When three of these detectors fire, um, then you produce a GZ state. And um, even if everything works perfectly, the success probability for this is one over, about one over thirty. So it's inherently probabilistic. Um, and uh, actually, even producing this type of heralded state has never been done before. Um, and it's, it's uh, many of you will also know about uh, these guys over in California, with some strong links to where we are now. Um, and of course, this is a key goal for, for that team over there. So, um, one way that you could try to make this into a scalable proposition is to have some kind of storage device, some kind of memory, so that um, even though it only works with the probability of uh, 1 over 30, um, if you run it, say, 100 times or 200 times or so, it will work eventually, right? And when it works, you can then store the output in those memories, and then you can release the output on demand. And so uh, having a memory like this turns this probabilistic uh, source of entanglement into a, into a deterministic source, um, running at a lower clock rate. So this is, this is uh, uh, the name for this is, is um, you can call this temporal multiplexing, um, but it's just a, it's just a, a, it's a pretty simple trick to turn uh, to make this into a scalable um, idea. So, uh, of course, it's super easy to do this type of memory. All you need is uh, a little fiber loop and a switch, and your photons come along. You switch them into the loop. They go round and round and round until you need them, and then when you when you need them, you switch them back out. Super easy. Um, okay, so unfortunately, that, this just doesn't work for technical reasons. Um, which uh, actually any of you guys could overcome, and maybe you will. So uh, uh, do this, and you can build a quantum computer. Um, but it just turns out that these losses are too high. So the other approach is to build a memory where what you do is you uh, turn a photon into a stationary excitation in some atoms, um, and then you retrieve it sometime later. Um, and so that's an approach that we followed. Uh, actually, this work was originally done uh, back in Oxford, uh, working with uh, Ian Wormsley, and um, the uh, the name for this scheme is a, a bit of a, s a silly name, uh, off-resonant cascade of absorption, um, and so that turned into an uh, into an acronym, which we're now kind of tied to. Um, but uh, so so here we're imagining an alkali atom which has a ground state, uh, a first excited state, um, and then a, a second excited state. Um, and what we do is we uh, uh, if we if a, the red photon is a photon we'd like to store. Um, and if we don't do anything, because it's tuned away from the resonance by this detuning delta, so it's not exactly matching the transition to the state 2, it will just propagate straight through um, all of the atoms. So these are, imagine, an ensemble of identical atoms of gas. So it's, it'll just propagate straight through, it's transparent. But if we want to store it, we can send in a strong laser pulse, which has enough energy to, uh, to give you a two-photon transition. So if you have to send in a strong laser pulse, which uh, gives you a two-photon transition to this state three, then now your input photon will be absorbed and turned into an excitation at this doubly excited state. Um, and a nice thing about this is because this storage state is way, way above the energy of thermal fluctuations at room temperature, um, that, then this system will work at room temperature. I want to highlight this guy, Elon, uh, firstly because he looks wonderful, um, but also because um, uh, he's going to pop up again in a, in a useful demonstration. Um, so, um, 
Uh, what we did in Oxford was we stored uh, uh, heralded single photons. This is a down conversion source, so we had a blue pump, a down conversion crystal, uh, and then uh, an idler detection, and then the signal, uh, the heralded signal photon was sent uh, through into this ensemble of cesium vapor, and this strong control pulse, the orange pulse now, uh, was counter propagating and uh, stored the photon in there, and then uh, a second pulse with a short delay came through afterwards and released it. And then what we did was look at the released photons. Um, we looked at the efficiency, but we also used a beam splitter to look at the uh, autocorrelation. That means how often do we see two photons here when we should have only seen one? And that measures the noise in the system. Um, and, so, uh, and so what we found with this measurement was uh, first that you can see storage here. So uh, the orange is the transmitted light through the cell when we're storing, so you can see with when we're not storing, everything comes through. When we, when we switch on the memory, uh, there's significant absorption. And you can also see retrieval at a delayed time. Um, and then we were also able to establish that the autocorrelation of the output photons was the same as the input. So I haven't shown you that, but it's, uh, that was really encouraging to us. It doesn't add any noise. Um, so uh, this was also um, uh, some work that was done uh, also with Elon, who, uh, who did this in rubidium vapor in um, uh, the Weizmann Institute. And they, uh, the nice thing about rubidium is that the transitions in rubidium are almost exactly degenerate. And that means that um, the Doppler shifts for this two-photon transition cancel. Right? When, you're, when your two fields are counter-propagating, any atom that's moving to the right is red-shifted for this photon as much as it's blue-shifted for that photon. So you get a nice cancellation of the Doppler shift, and that means your lifetime uh, is extended. So this is Elon showing up again, just to show that connection. And the lifetime now is, is around about 100 nanoseconds, around 90 nanoseconds. And the key thing that's exciting about that is you imagine if you're running at a clock rate of around a gigahertz, that's around uh, 80 attempts, right? So that's long enough to try a probabilistic process 80 times uh, and, then, and then retrieve it again. So, um, uh, so, okay, so then I just want to quickly uh, use uh, this chance to, um, to plug this spin-out company, which is called Orca Computing. This was what I wanted to have as a logo with some kind of, uh, kind of laser on its friggin' head. Um, but uh, we, so we weren't allowed to do that, so that's kind of a uh, much more sober thing. Um, but my, the, the plug is, is that, um, so we are uh, up and running now. We've raised some uh, venture capital in pre-seed uh, and some grants. Um, we have patents. Uh, we have uh, some, some great guys that we've uh, hired now. Um, and we have, uh, we're building a demonstrator system. Um, and that's going to be in White City, um, unless, uh, unless something explodes. Um, and so um, this is my chance to really say, if any of you guys are interested to join this effort, which is uh, to, to build a photonic quantum computer that uses quantum memories for synchronization, uh, which, is, which is an approach that hasn't been done before, then uh, please get in touch. Um, uh, this, this is my, my the company email, or just find me on my university email, um, uh, and, and uh, or, uh, we do actually have a, a website as well, and you can get in touch with our CEO. Um, so, uh, I don't know, do I have, I, I've probably run out of time, do I have any time left? Uh, maybe a couple of okay, another couple of minutes. Well, okay, all I'll do is just briefly tell you about um, uh, a way that we, that uh, at, at the university group, we're uh, thinking of trying to also uh, use some of the <laughs> ideas. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it's, it's quite useful to be able to, to make a switch, so as well as a memory, to be able to, so remember, even when I was motivating the idea of a memory, I said if you had a fast switch, you could actually make a memory just using a fiber loop. So if you can do a fast switch, that's, an, that's a useful bit of technology. Here's, here's a concept for doing switching. Suppose I have a ring cavity, so these three mirrors are facing each other so that light goes round and round uh, and it forms a resonant cavity. Um, if I couple into a cavity resonantly, then light goes in and then it can also couple out if there's a, a little bit of leakage of this mirror. So in this way, light will, uh, will uh, find its way in and then find its way out. Um, on the other hand, if I completely mess up this cavity with a bunch of loss, then this interference effect goes away and all this light sees is a really highly reflective mirror here. So it's just gonna bounce off. Okay, so if you can introduce loss um, into, a, into a cavity, then you can make a switch. Um, and so here's a question, could you use this two photon transition uh, to introduce switchable loss? What, what the idea is that you uh, introduce your control field 
And um, when your photon comes along, if it satisfies two photon resonance, it will be heavily absorbed, and that's the lossy version. And of course, if the control field is not there, you propagate straight through and it's transparent. So this is a this is um, uh, the, the thing about this is that now the um, you're able to make a switch um, based on the strength of your um, storage interaction, but you're not relying on actually storing any energy inside the atoms. Um, one uh, final piece of the puzzle that's pretty useful for this type of application is could you integrate this and also the quantum memories inside hollow fibers that would allow you to make a, uh, an entirely fiber integrated system. Uh, and so these were some experiments that we did um, showing that you could get extremely high optical depths inside a, inside a hollow fiber. Um, so th this is um, what you do is, okay, if you're a laser physicist, you know, um, uh, just try hitting it with a laser, right? It's, um, so when you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So um, uh, uh, you can't get enough atoms inside your fiber, so you blow a big laser pulse in and you find you get an enormous optical depth. Um, uh, and what it's doing is it's actually blasting the atoms off the walls of the fiber where they've, where they've adhered. Um, okay, um, I think that's uh, about it. So that's the support that we had, um, and uh, that's it. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you. I mean, actually, when I started the group at Bath, I've been at Bath for about two years. Um, so when I started that, we, we, we'd already um, uh, patented the, 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 the stuff. And so I, didn't, I, I definitely wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to just work on on the, on the, the memory that the company was going to work on. I, th I, think, um, I think there's a, without rambling too much, I think there's a, there's a nice division between what companies can do and what university labs can do. Um, you know, this vision of building a large entangled state, um, you know, when you draw the diagrams it looks great, but obviously that re requires thousands of components, and um, it's, I mean, a university is a terrible place to make a thousand of anything, right? um, you definitely, and what you can't do is, suppose you demonstrate something with an efficiency of 50%, you can't really ask a PhD student to do the same thing that the last guy did, but make it 60%. Because you need to get a thesis, you need to write papers. And so in university labs, we're great at showing stuff that's a bit crap and then moving on. But I think in the company, what we can do is iterate on the performance until it's uh, really optimized. So I, I think they're complementary. Uh, yeah, quick, thank you, Josh, again. Oh, great.